And if you go back in time, that's how long these corrective cycles have lasted before. The, there was a whole bunch of things that were different in the economy back then. And personally, we don't think the prices are going to drop like they did before. I can't, I mean, maybe that's me hoping, to be honest with you, like you guys are, but it's possible. So what we're, what we, you know, Julie and I are, you know, Boy Scouts. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And that's what we want all of you and all of you watching right now in Livecast, assuming Ventura is making this work, <laughs> uh, to understand. You got to hope for the best. You got to prepare for the worst. So what does that mean? Julie just said something, and I want you to pay very close attention to it. Can anybody explain to me what a strategic default was? There's a term from yesteryear. Anyone remember those? What's a, just say it out loud. I'll repeat it so it's on mic so they can hear. Anybody? It was a financial plan. I mean, yeah, you're in Vegas. House, so I can't, yeah. But here's the thing. Back when, okay, strategic default, for those of you guys who don't know, is basically where a seller stops making a house payment, stays in the house, and doesn't pay the bank. And in most states, they pass laws, and the laws were in place before, that it allows people to sometimes stay in the house for months and sometimes in the house for years. Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it is what it is. In 2007 and 2008 and 2009, nobody knew what the ramifications of that type of real estate market were going to be. Nobody knew what people's behaviors were. Back then, when you did a short sale, it was the same as a foreclosure, and you couldn't buy a house for how long? Years. Seven. It changed to two. Okay, so it changed to two, like in 2000, anybody know mortgage laws better than me? I don't remember. 2012 or 13, maybe? Then they changed it so you could buy a house two years after a short sale. But back then, my point is, is back then when the wheels were coming off the wagon in a meaningful way in 07, 08, or 09, people, uh, there was no proven eject button. There was no proven, proven path. People didn't know what, it was all this uncertainty. You'd go on listing appointments and have calls and people were like panicked. They no, everything's changed now. So here's what Julie and I think is going to happen. Not in every market, not in an equal way, but because the sellers know that, okay, first of all, Jane, Behaviorally, when people have no equity in their house, do they keep on making their payment based on the last recession? No. Typically not. Some yeah. people have a conscience. Yes, yeah. well. <laughs> they will do it, but it's like throwing money away. But that's the rationalization, yeah. right? And there are whole websites set up for that. There are whole communities set up. So what people, have, what we know from history is that two things. Write these things down. I promise you everything the rest of the day is more fun. Psychologically, <laughs> when people miss one payment, they don't ever catch the mortgage up. They're out. Like 90% of the time, they don't catch the mortgage up. Number two, we also know behaviorally that when people are, even with their mortgage, don't have any equity or underwater, they stop making their payment. These aren't opinions. These are facts based on the last crash. Now, behaviorally, here's what's interesting to us. Nobody predicted those things would happen. Nobody predicted the banks, because it had never happened before. So nobody predicted that the uh, equity situation would result in so many strategic defaults. So here's, there's two sides to this, and then we're going to tell you why we could be wrong too. So we're going to balance this. There's two sides to this. Because the market did come back up in many markets, but understand nationwide, there's a lot of people that are still at, at, uh, don't have equity in their properties. Jane, what is it? In Vegas, it's like 18 or 14% of all homeowners are still underwater? Yeah, I'm still doing short sales. Not as... Yeah. Ohio, it's the same way. I mean, there's a lot of people that never right. have gained their, their 2006 values. They, they have never come back up. So what you're going to see is a couple, Brandon's about to cry. What, what you're going to see is you're going to see a situation where people are going to do one of two things, and we don't know. They're either going to, in markets where they're at, you know, where there's no equity, and because past history tells them what to do, they know that they can do the short sale or the strategic, they know they can stay in the house for free. They know all these, they know. It's on the internet. They can Google it and they know what their bank's going to do. Okay, so one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to do that fast. So before, people waited years, 2007, then they default and like they couldn't make their payment and then they, this, all the, so it, it would, the whole thing was protracted, you know, for six or seven years from crash to 2011. So it could happen faster in most markets because people know what to do and because there's more of an organized, graceful exit, as Fannie and Freddie Mae used to call it, that people know that they can take. And or, they've been watching it. Last time, nobody saw it coming. This time, people know to watch for right. it. Right. Or, or, this is the flip side, 
they could actually say, you know what, I'm going to suck it up, Buttercup, and I'm going to keep making my payment because I saw house prices crash before, and I'm going to keep making this payment because i got to live someplace anyway uh, because I know prices are going to come back. Except if they know that they don't. And then you're going to have, uh, you're going to have essentially, there's going to be no cards left to play. And those markets that should have essentially result, uh, essentially the houses that are zombie type houses that are like Vegas where there's over 10% that are still underwater and a lot of other markets like that. Do you guys even know what your rates are of underwater owners? Nobody reports on it. They've been watching it, probably. Yeah, you haven't been watching it. You need to write that down. You need to do your homework. You need to find out basically what percent of owners in your marketplace are still underwater. I'll tell you something else, a statistic I'd be watching like a hawk, well, we do, is uh, what the notice of default rate is. Anyone want to explain what the uh, NOD rate is, what it means? It's obvious, right? The number of people that are defaulting on their mortgages. But here's the problem. Banks don't report them when they default. In California, for example, Gary, you were in the market then. Is, wasn't it used to be uh, two or, th thanks for the tie, too, it's great. Two or three um, payments, and then they were, in California, is, then weren't the banks supposed to, by California law, file an NOD? Was that what it was? 90 days. 90 days, okay, but they didn't. They didn't. And how long were they sitting on some of those defaulted loans? Six months. Six months, in the longer. Yeah, so th that's what you guys are going to see again. So counting on the NODs, which the Wall Street wonks watch. Yeah. So if the Wall Street wonks are telling you, oh, the notice default rate isn't increasing, and this, everything's fine and dandy, can't count on it. Because they're using delayed information. That's the reason that you guys have to be going on listing appointments. You have to be talking to people, and you have to find out what the pre-qual them, find out what their equity situation is, and use your own smarts to be ahead of the market. And watch BPO orders, because those do go That up. is you another great way. Them. That is actually the best way. A BPO, BPO orders are, I mean, Rochelle, help me out here. How many BPO orders, how many BPOs are ordered for the average house once it starts defaulting? It's not one. No, it's three. Three, okay. So when you see an increase in, B, who's doing BPOs? Who has a BPO? Okay, very good. Smart way to basically keep your income consistent and an awesome way to get your foot in the door early with your REO companies, okay? All of you should be doing BPOs, write that down. Mevo people, same thing. Do get early on the list for BPOs, because once you have those relationships locked up, they're supposed to do some sort of grading and whatnot, but the reality of it is, is if you do a great job on your BPOs, you're going to get REOs. Everyone understanding what we're saying here? This is a type of thing you might not need to do all in all of your market, but in certain splices of your market, you're definitely going to want to do that. Lena, you look a little nervous. No. Is that just your normal look? <laughs> <laughs> Lena's my favorite coaching client because she misses a lot of coaching calls and I get paid anyway. <laughs> you knew I was going to say that yes. joke. Yes, there you go. Um, before you go on, I want to tell a really quick story about uh, strategic defaults. Back when we lived in Vegas, and I can't remember the name of the neighborhood, Jane. Uh, maybe you can help me out and jog my memory later. But we were looking for a house. We were looking to move in Vegas. And we went out one evening, becoming dusk, and we saw a house that we had seen listed somewhere, but there was no sign. Looked vacant. We started to walk around it. Neighbor from across the street comes out. Do you remember this? And he said, are you looking for a house to buy? Because I'm about to sell my house. He didn't have a sign either. We started talking to him. He goes, here's what's going on in the neighborhood. I'm going to buy that guy's house and then default on mine. Buy and He's going to buy that house and default on his. We're all buying and bailing. The whole neighborhood. And this was not like first time buyer houses either. That was strategic. Okay. You now, guys understand what she's saying? <laughs> So I'm a, you're going to short sell. You're going to short sell your house, and so you owe 500 on your house, and you're you're going to short sell it. And your neighbor happens to be the one buying it. The bank has accepted an offer for 400, and then you're going to do the same thing and just and same, they weren't same, even same thing. they weren't even missing payments. This was totally strategic. And, and they get were, the loan first, and then they default. So they were buying the house yeah. first, and then they were defaulting on their current ones. Now so, I do think it, from city to city there is some cultural aspect to this where. Perhaps in Vegas, for example, in LA, that people are maybe a little bit more sanguine with this than maybe in Lance and Karen's market where you don't see that kind of thing as prevalently. So you've got to watch your own stats and your own behavior because these things can change. We were you know, coaching short sale at the time, and that surprised us that it was to that degree. So watch your own local market. Okay, so let's hover here. So, that's it. so how's everyone feeling? Give us some feedback here. I told you we we're going to do the heavy lifting first. What is everyone thinking? Call it. What are you thinking? Okay. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about your market. In the past 90 days or so, I think your normal listing inventory has risen from five to seven to, I think you're gaining on about 15 listings in inventory. This is very different than your past three years. Right. We are seeing a higher inventory of 500 plus, depending on the market. And we're seeing short sales happen in the most sellers 
And she's in Atlanta, a normal market, a non-coastal market. So it's happening. And she's like the top Remax agent in all of Atlanta, too, actually, Northern I'm, Atlanta. I'm really not impressed. I'm actually excited about it because that's when I started coaching with you guys, and when the last recession hit. And so the skill sets that people develop are really high That's an excellent point because the things that we're talking to all of you about kind of early perhaps right now, everything you learn from this that we're doing today applies in a changing market, even in a hot market. The taking action part, the doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it, the knowing your numbers, being able to have real conversations with sellers about what's happening, setting their expectations. Maybe their expectation isn't 12 offers by midnight. It's maybe it's going to take 10 days and we only get one offer. And that, then that becomes 30 days. Phase. Going into the next phase.